Good evening. Welcome to the U.S. Geological Survey in another installment of our continuing public lecture series. Some of you may have noticed that your favorite chair has moved a bit. Um, we have a, a big scientific workshop here tomorrow. Um, so thank you for being flexible. <laughs> My name is Leslie Gordon, and those of you who come regularly know that I always have announcements because I want you to come back next month and the month after and the month after. So our January public lecture is Jonathan Stock. He'll be talking about how humans have changed erosion in Hawaii. In February, uh, retired seismologist Ross Stein will be talking about the 1906 earthquake and modern seismic science. And then in March, we're going to go to the local beaches and talk about California's marine terraces with Marjorie Schultz. So do please join us in the next few months. Tonight's lecturer is USGS seismologist Susan Huff. Susan is in our Pasadena office, and we're very lucky <laughs> that she is, was able to travel to Northern California to be with us tonight. She's been with the USGS since 1992. Before that, she uh, had a, an undergraduate degree in geophysics from UC Berkeley, a PhD in Earth Sciences from Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and completed a postdoc at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. She has over 100 articles, published articles to her credit, and five books, including not only technical, but a couple of, or said more than a couple, of popular non-technical books that I highly recommend, whether it's about earthquakes and faults in California or Charles Richter. Um, Susan's research interests include ground motion, historical earthquakes, and earthquake hazards. She has led the deployment following earthquakes for aftershock deployment, that is, um, not only with the Loma Prieta earthquake 25 years ago, but with Northridge, Haiti, and most recently in Nepal. So please welcome Susan Huff. Okay, so the first question is whether I'm wired properly for sound. Yes. Okay, you can hear me. <laughs> so, um, and first, thank you very much to Leslie. If you've come here frequently, you know that she's one of the key people who uh, makes these talks happen. Also, uh, Michael Moore, who you don't see, not the Michael Moore, but, <laughs> but a Michael Moore, who is the, the, the wizard who's um, making the, the video and the uh, audiovisual happen. Um, I'm going to ask you to uh, kindly bear with me this evening. If I seem a little tired, it's because I'm a little tired. Um, I woke up at 2.30 this morning, or last night, and flew, d flew up and was here, gave a talk at noon, uh, and then had a, a good time talking with, with colleagues. And so now uh, this is the second installment. Uh, the good news is that uh, being involved with earthquake response teaches you how to keep going when you're too tired to keep going, so I have some practice at this. Uh, the other part of the good news is that giving the noontime talk let me get some of the kinks out, so hopefully you're seeing the new and improved version. So um, I'm going to be talking about this earthquake that happened last year, this year, and um, I'm going to start by just touching on why we, why we care about this earthquake and, um, and why the USGS responds uh, to an earthquake on the other side of the planet. I mean, it's an area with enormous earthquake risk, um, and that's obviously something that um, we all care about. Uh, it's, it's an important event to understand. The data are limited, so it's very important to go and collect the whatever uh, additional data you can, um, but also it's, it's critical that we learn the lessons from this earthquake for earthquake hazard in other places. Big earthquakes like this are not that common, fortunately, the magnitude 8-ish earthquakes, um, and so we really need to be sure we, we um, take the opportunities to learn as much as we can about the ones that do happen. So um, 
Yeah, here's a quote from a, a guy that you may have heard about, um, although probably not commenting so much on geology, but uh, Charles Darwin, looking at, at mountain ranges, realized that mountain ranges were a challenge to understand because most physical processes, as Darwin knew, tend to wear things down. So enormous mountains mean enormous uh, forces which weren't understood in the, in the 19th century. Uh, you're looking at the, the Himalayan range, that's Everest there. Um, so at, now we understand, and we have for a long time, uh, why the mountains are there. And uh, I'll also ask you to bear with me. I know, I know this is a diverse audience, but also a, a very well-educated audience. So if I'm telling you things you learned in, in kindergarten, um, bear with me. It'll, it'll get a little less uh, trite as, as we go along. But um, the Indian landmass, the Indi what's now the Indi Indian Peninsula was a separate landmass um, and moving around uh, as a separate plate until it collided with the Eurasian plate about 10 million years ago, at a process that started to build up, um, build up the mountains and elevate the, the Tibetan plateau. Uh, so it, it's similar to an oceanic subduction zone in that you have one plate the Indian plate in cross-section is diving under the Eurasian plate along a, the major plate boundary fault is here. And you're going to see other cross-sections that, that look, like, um, look like this, different forms of it. So this is a major active plate boundary. India is still pushing into Eurasia at a rate of a few centimeters per year. Um, and that gives rise to enormous earthquakes all along the plate boundary. So this is the collisional plate boundary, and then it transitions to a, a mostly strike-slip boundary, and then a complicated boundary to the east through Myanmar, which is another place I'm working at the moment, um, and then down into the Andaman-Sumatran subduction zone. So this map, and there's other versions of this that circulate shows earthquakes that have happened on different segments of the, the major plate boundary uh, in historical times. Um, you need to take maps like this with a grain of salt. We put a little bar on, say, 1505 was a big earthquake. Well, what we really know about that earthquake is, is kind of sketchy. It's not clear that it was really this big. Um, but um, this is the history that we've pieced together. Uh, 1934 earthquake, which I'm going to talk about under Nepal, is this black segment. This is jumping around like mad. So this is going to be possibly exciting. Uh, so the 1934 earthquake, uh, I just wanted to mention this. We know a little bit more about this event uh, because it was relatively recent. There's a little bit of instrumental data. Um, the magnitude estimates have varied from maybe 7.8 to as high as 8.3. Recently, we think it was more towards 8.3, so bigger. Uh, it did break the plate boundary all the way up to the surface. A surface rupture was identified just within the last five years. Uh, and so um, this peanut-shaped contour is, is an estimate of the fault patch in the 2015 Gorkha earthquake, the fault, the patch of the fault that moved. Uh, but so you can see that the 1934 event was uh, contiguous and, and essentially non-overlapping. Okay, so sizing up the future earthquake hazard, uh, my colleague Roger Billum has come up with some great figures that everybody uh, borrows and uses, and so I'm, I'm going to do the same. Uh, trying to illustrate the extent of hazard along the plate boundary. And this is sort of an earthquake thermometer that attempts to show how much stress is built up on each of the plate boundary segments and what size earthquake could be generated if segments went essentially tomorrow. And there's a lot of uncertainties, but you can see what, this is what we call the central gap that hasn't had a very big earthquake since 1505 and, and maybe not since uh, the 13th century. Um, the 1934 zone, there's been a lot of concern for a repeat of the 1934 earthquake, um, that that could produce a magnitude 8-ish earthquake. 
Uh, and then you'll notice this little bar here that looks kind of inconsequential. That turns out to be most of the segment that broke uh, in this earthquake with a little bit into the, into the edges. Um, but so the main point is that we know that there's enormous uh, hazard along, along this arc and, and the potential and the inevitability of these large earthquakes. Magnitude 8, but, but up to potentially magnitude 9. Uh, there's further concern for the Kathmandu Valley. This is a Google Earth view that shows that it really, it's a valley that's, that's nestled in the, in the Himalayan range. Um, it's a, an old lake bed zone similar to Mexico City, and that's a setting that we know will generally amplify uh, seismic waves and contribute to a higher degree of hazard. Uh, we've worried about Nepal because of the construction um, it's, you know, there is a building code, but there's essentially no effective enforcement. Um, there's no effective land use planning. The construction quality is, is generally uh, poor, and, and construction is literally sort of all over the place in, in the size and shape of buildings. And to illustrate that, there's this guy here. Um, you, know, you can wonder where they put the staircase and something like that. Like that. But buildings, it's, it's sort of amazing if you've, if you've never been there, buildings grow, go up and then if, if they can, people will sort of build over neighboring buildings and it's all sort of very haphazard. Uh, this is, this tall gentleman is Ari Nathan, who's the, the, essentially the head science guy with the U.S. State Department for Southeast Asia and he was a, a very strong and appreciated supporter of the USGS response. So it's been pointed out, ironically, in terms of earthquake risk, that, in, um, that things have gotten worse over time. You might think that old construction would be vulnerable, but it, it's realized now that some of the oldest traditional construction in places like Nepal, uh, this, some of this is from Kashmir, is actually fairly resilient with wood elements, whereas the new construction is, is concrete um, and it's actually more vulnerable. Um, and then there's the, the population density in Kathmandu Valley, which is just mushroomed uh, even in the last 10 or 15 years. And it's largely due to political pressures. The, there have been Maoist insurgencies in the, in the outlying areas. It's been uh, unstable and people have flocked to the Kathmandu Valley, which politically has been relatively stable and, and safer. So just in 10 years, the population grew by, by about 50%. Um, and then on April 25th, uh, at noon local time, it appeared that worse fears were realized. And people in the US woke up to news that um, first it was estimated at magnitude 7.9, and then it came down to 7.8. But the news that a 7.8 had hit central Nepal was the stuff that, that nightmares were made of in my business. Uh, and then the, the details that came out were not uh, any more encouraging. Um, the earthquake was centered uh, where this red dot is to the west of Kathmandu, which is here, and it broke to the east. And the faults, um, okay, so this is another cross section from south on the left to north. Uh, you can see that the plate boundary is, uh, has this front part that reaches the surface, what we call a ramp, and then it flattens out uh, into um, what's technically called a decolmont, uh, and this part of the fault broke, and then it, as it goes down, um, it actually steepens a little bit. But so the fault is, is a, almost horizontal, and it's directly underneath Nepal, uh, and it ruptured directly underneath the Kathmandu Valley. So what matters, you know, as in our, our general understanding, what matters for shaking is how big an earthquake was and how far away you are from it and from the fault that's moving. So if the fault is moving about 12 kilometers be beneath your feet and going right by, that's very um, close proximity, which I realize is not good grammar. Um, but all of Nepal was very close to that, to that rupture. Uh, this is work by colleagues in, at the USGS in Golden, Gavin Hayes, uh, Dan McNamara, and others. So an, 
this is the, again, this, this contour is what's been uh, imaged as the, the sort of more precise patch of the fault that, that broke. But again, you probably can't see it. There's a little triangle here that's Kathmandu Valley. So the, that, the earthquake went right underneath. And this figure here uh, shows, it's essentially a shake map uh, equivalent of the, the shaking generated by the earthquake, uh, which I need to explain because there, there weren't a lot of uh, seismic instruments in Nepal or neighboring countries. There were some, uh, but some of the best data that we have to look at the ground motions comes from the as assessment of seismic intensities. Uh, what we commonly use the modified Mercalli scale. You might have heard of that. This is a little bit different, but it's the same, same idea um, that you rate the severity of shaking on a scale of 1 to 10 based on the effects that an earthquake causes. So 1 is not felt, 10 is catastrophic destruction. And um, the, the main result that you can see here is that this map is mostly yellow with a little bit of orange, but it's not bright red. And that's telling what, what turned out to be the really surprising story, uh, a part of the story, sorry, that you know, this was the earthquake we expected, a magnitude 8. It was, appeared to be a direct hit. And yet the intensities were in the range of 6 to 7, and in some cases as high as 8, but not commonly. And that is not as, as catastrophic as uh, we would have expected. So, and in fact, if you look at the, the impact of the event, um, images like this started to be broadcast very quickly around the world, some damage to, uh, catastrophic damage to iconic cultural heritage sites. This is uh, back to poor, I'm sorry, it's not, it's uh, Kathmandu, Durbar Square. Um, this is the Darahara uh, Tower. I actually did have a before picture and then it, it failed. Uh, there were quite a few fatalities, people that had been climbing it at midday on a Saturday. Um, this is from, this photo is by Brian Collins, who's actually here. He was uh, part of the team that was in Nepal after the earthquake assessing landslides. And so this shows uh, some of the catastrophic damage to local villages up in the mountains. Uh, and you can see how uh, some of these little towns appear to have just been flattened. So these were the images that, that were broadcast in the early aftermath of the earthquake. And I wanted, I wanted to show back to poor Durbar Square because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a location where we've now come full circle. Uh, this is a, a famous before and after picture from the 1934 earthquake. And now this was, we've come around to well after 1934, that's me for scale, and now after 2015. Um, now what's interesting about this is that, that <laughs> come on, um, I have to push the center button to get the pointer back, but if, I, if I'm slightly wrong, I advance it by mistake. The one temple that, that failed catastrophically, the one that's growing out of my head, okay, it's not, in these earlier photos. So it actually postdates the 1934 earthquake and reconstruction, and that's the one that, that came down. Um, but you'll notice that if you look in the background, uh, there's a lot of other structures that weren't too badly damaged, apparently. And that's what started to catch my eye even before, um, even before I went there, is in a lot of these photos, I showed you this before, but look at the, at the background and in the, the, some of the structures you see. And I, was started, I started to be struck by the damage that you don't see in the backgrounds. Uh, and still, so going into Kathmandu, I had a sense by that point, this was about a month after the earthquake, um, the, the death toll figures at that point were around 9,000, which is when one doesn't want to to minimize the extent of that as, as, a, as a tragic event. Um, and there were a lot of, there were hundreds of thousands of homes destroyed. Um, but if you had, people had um, made forecasts of the expected impact of a magnitude 8-ish direct hit 
on central Nepal and had feared that the death toll would be tens or, or hundreds of thousands. Um, and so there was a sense that it, it was not as, as catastrophic as had been feared. But this was flying into uh, the airport. And so this is about a month after the earthquake. And if you can see, there's a sea, this is on the outskirts of the central city. There's, a, there's these ubiquitous three to maybe five story buildings. Um, and here and there, you can see a little flash of blue. And so, uh, some of them are, are likely tarps where people moved outside, either because their home was damaged or just because they were afraid of earthquakes. But what's really striking and what I was, did not expect was you mostly see a sea of, of intact buildings. This is not the kind of damage you saw in Port-au-Prince after the Haiti earthquake where there was much more pervasive damage. This is another street scene just driving around Kathmandu and I just figured I should I would take a video but it could be any number of streets. You can get a sense of the typical construction. Um, and you wouldn't know that an earthquake had, had happened. And this wasn't cherry picked. This was, was quite common. Um, this was another st street scene. I'm showing this because it's actually right around the corner from, from Kathmandu Durbar Square. So you have this, the, the location where all the cameras are going, all the images you're seeing. If you walk out around the corner, and again, a street scene where you just don't see obvious signs of, of damage. Um, this is from a, a village, Nagarkot, on the outskirts of Kathmandu, a, a, a uh, very typical uh, style of building. There is some wood elements in here, which is good, but you can get a sense of, of the brick construction, how vulnerable it would be to shaking, and, and no significant signs of, of damage here. Okay, this is a private home in Kathmandu. Um, a well-built, quite well-built home, but still it, it was full of you know, small objects, knickknacks. I was, uh, toured the house with the owner. He said he had, they had one little mask that was tilted on a shallow window sill that fell off and broke, but otherwise nothing fell, nothing was displaced, no damage in the house. And this is, this is a house sitting right on top of a magnitude 7.8 earthquake. So, uh, to my mind at least, the major question of this earthquake is uh, not the fact that it happened, but the ground motions that it generated, and the nature of the shaking, and why the damage wasn't even worse than, than what was experienced. So, I, I already showed you some of this. One of the, the key data sets that we have is this intensity data. Um, and uh, I was involved with this study, but it was mostly my a young colleague, Stacy Martin, who's originally from India. He's done a lot of work on assessing intensities for earthquakes, uh, mostly historical earthquakes in India. And he sprang into action after this earthquake and set out to collect accounts of the, of the event on the media, on YouTube, uh, anything he could find that had enough information to reliably assess a intensity in the US, we have the Did You Feel It system, which some of you may have used. I hope you've used it, um, where people go to the web if you feel an earthquake and, and fill out the questionnaire. And then maps like this are generated automatically. Uh, this was a different ball game. This involved finding a total of uh, 3,400 accounts, a set, figuring out where they were, and, and assessing them. So, OK, this is the. The map, if you contour that to produce something that looks more like a traditional shake map, you can really see a spatially rich view of, of the shaking throughout Nepal and into India and neighboring countries. Um, and so I already showed uh, a version of this map and, and this basic result that you have a sea of yellow here. Um, so moderately strong shaking. Um, but, but again, not catastrophic. So the first figure I showed was the, were the intensities from 1934, which were assessed after the fact. Uh, and so this was the 2015 earthquake. Uh, there were some, um, some outliers to uh, some locations where there was uh, locally higher damage. One that I'll show you is Swayambhunath Temple, or it's also known as the Monkey Temple. 
And this is a, one of the more famous cultural heritage sites in Kathmandu. Um, it, it's not just a, a central shrine. It, it, it was a complex with monastery buildings, stores, uh, homes surrounding it. And it was by far the worst damage that, that I saw when I was there. It looked like a bomb had gone off. Uh, many of these buildings were just sort of shattered. And uh, this is a before picture that I found on the web that shows the complex, the buildings that had been around it. You, and you can see, I think here, it's on the top of a, of a small local hill. And if you stand back, pan back, and again, a Google Earth, view, you can see that hill poking up in the lake bed zone. So this is, without even doing any um, investigation, whoops, go, out, go away. This is a, uh, clearly a classic case of what we call topographic amplification. So um, we know that shaking is usually amplified where you have sediment filled valleys and basins, but shaking can also be amplified on small hills and ridges. Um, and it's something that we don't understand. Um, well, we understand it, it we don't, we don't, we're not able to characterize it systematically, um, but we've seen it in, in many cases. It was an important part of the story in Port-au-Prince after the Haiti earthquake. Um, so, uh, but okay, let's look at, uh, let's look in a little more detail at the, the ground motions and what we can say about them. So we have the intensity data. We do have some instrumental data, not as much as we would like. And some of what we do have, we don't really have because uh, it's not being made available to, to the community. Hopefully it will be at some point. Uh, there were six strong motion instruments. Uh, oh, come on. Uh, in all in the Kat Kathmandu Valley. Uh, one was installed, was a USGS instrument that was installed by the USGS in collaboration with Caltech. It was named CATNIP. Um, and this may be the, one of the most famous uh, earthquake recordings in the history of earthquake recordings, uh, because this was the only record that was released uh, quickly after the earthquake. It wasn't immediate because the instrument wasn't phoning home because it had lost internet connection for a problem that was downstream of the instrument. So it was, it was a little blue box, I'll show it to you. It was working, it just wasn't transmitting data. So somebody had to visit it, download the data, but as soon as it was downloaded, it was, we pushed it out to the world. And so that was the one record of this, of this earthquake. Um, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. There was one recording from the Department of Mines and Geology that has been released now a nice study that was just published. There are four recordings uh, that were from instruments installed by a Japanese group in collaboration with a local university. Those have not been released. Um, and then there's some other data from high-rate GPS instruments. Uh, it turns out that the same GPS that will locate your phone, if you record that data and sample it fast enough, like five, five samples per second, you can actually turn a GPS instrument into a seismometer by moving the, measuring the displacement of, of anything uh, five times a second. I mean, that's essentially a seismometer. Um, and then we have some regional data from uh, Indian networks that is generally not available, but hopefully will be soon. But so this is, this is the catnip record. It's three components, so instruments record motion uh, that's up and down, so the vertical is here, and then the two horizontals, north, south, and east, west. And for people that are used to looking at seismograms, this is a, a remarkable seismogram. Um, a lot of people looked at this and thought there was something wrong with, with the instrument. The vertical looks a little more like what we expect. Um, you can see uh, the different, you can see, um, high frequency energy coming in here, and I'm, I'll talk more about frequencies of, of seismic waves in a second, but what you see here are these long period back and forth without a lot of jittery shaking on top, and that just doesn't look like most records of, of big earthquakes. 
So zooming in just on the north-south component, just so you can see it a little better, this is recording acceleration. Uh, it turns out if you want to record big earthquakes on scale, we usually record acceleration because it's, it's easier to record acceleration on scale than to record velocity on scale. Uh, it's a detail. But if you take this record, you can integrate it twice and get a displacement record. And you can actually see how the ground moved in this earthquake. And this is the north-south component. So it's sitting, Kathmandu's sitting here minding its own business. The earthquake comes along and it moves south about a meter. Uh, and it also moved, it moved uh, yeah, south and up. I'm not showing you vertical. Um, but in the span, if you look at the, the time axis, it, was, it took about five seconds. So in five seconds, it went up and south, but fairly slowly and fairly smoothly. And so in terms of acceleration, it generated these long pulses. So people were thinking there was something wrong with the, with the instrument, or maybe something had happened to the site, uh, or there had been something strange about the installation. Um, it was none of the above. It, the instrument was installed by John Galetska, who was with Caltech at the time. That's the top of his head. Um, and the installation was fine. It was a small structure. Nothing happened to it. That's the top of my head. Uh, when I visited, we tilt tested it, which confirms that the, the, uh, the instrument was operating properly at the time. Uh, and then another uh, confirmation comes from this little video that somebody out in cyberspace put together um, sort of for the fun of it. And so when I push the button to play, the, the bar below is going to sweep through the record. And then the video is going to show you a, a video of a server room that was not too far from where the instrument was located. So you can watch what a room is doing uh, through the the data that's recorded on the instrument. Let's get the cursor back. Okay, so this is fun. And if you're, if you're interested, I can get you this video. It's a lot of fun to watch in a, in a scary sort of way. So the earthquake happens. You can see this jittery motion that starts to respond. And then the main pulse comes through. And there goes the racks. And that's what, we, when we talk about the frequency content of seismic waves, and you know, some people aren't used to thinking about that. Um, and then it, you can see that the coda, there's an interesting little blip here that I don't, still don't understand exactly what that is. It's, it's real. Um, but and you can see the, the coda. Uh, let's see, I might be able to back it up and just play it one more time. So, it's initially the P wave that comes through, and then it's going to be the start of, whoops, why did I stop it? Okay. It's essentially the start of the S wave, but it's going, and I think, uh, one thousand two. I think it's in real time. So, you can see things moving back and forth, and it takes about five seconds to go through a cycle. So, that's an acceleration pulse with a, a five second period. And then you can just watch, you know, the, the coda. Okay. So, all right, it did this before. This is exactly where it hung up. And I, bah. <laughs> yeah, okay, there's something about the video that this computer doesn't like because it just won't go past it. Um, so I have to get out of, get out of PowerPoint and just start it again. Okay. So um, that's one of the challenges for, for seismologists to sort of deconstruct and understand uh, the ground motions and, and the earthquake. And, um, so the basic observations, you had this long period energy, five to six second pulses, and you had low high frequency energy, so low jittery energy. And I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about high frequency energy, and I realize it's, it's, it's a somewhat 
technical term, but it basically just means a sort of jittery motion back and forth like this or maybe in one second as opposed to more like five seconds. And then the, the, low, the peak acceleration was relatively low. And if you don't like frequencies, um, a, a good analogy is, is music, that if this were a, a musical um, you know, two-minute symphony here, uh, it would have booming low tones, low frequencies, uh, depleted high tones, and depleted peak high tones. It's basically what we're talking about. So to try to understand that, um, one of the things we're looking at is this intensity data set and trying to uh, use it to, to map out the distribution of shaking. So this is, again, data from, oh no, don't do that. <laughs> um, so data from earthquake effects gives us this map. We have some instruments that were scattered around at these circles. Uh, now that's supposed to give me the cursor. Come back. All right. So at these circles, we had some instruments, and we can record the peak accelerations. And so I convert those into intensities and compare them with the intensities that were determined directly. And the map shows that the correspondence is pretty good. So we can actually use the intensities to generate simulated instrumental data and use that to, to investigate the details of the earthquake. Uh, so one of the things that, that you can do is look at the, uh, what's PGA, peak ground acceleration, uh, is a simple parameter, but it's been used in earthquake engineering a long time. So this is peak ground acceleration versus the distance, the nearest distance to the fault uh, at any one location uh, for for the near field uh, in Kathmandu Valley, everything's at the same nearest fault distance. And then there's a curve of predicted values from a, a, a what we call a ground motion prediction equation that was determined before the earthquake. So this is predicted for a 7.8. And what you can see is that the estimated uh, peak ground accelerations actually track the predicted curve fairly well. Um, Okay, now I should say this is a predicted curve for subduction zone earthquakes. If I, if I showed you the predicted curve for a 7.8 on the San Andreas, say a strike-slip earthquake, it would be a lot higher. So the overall shaking level and the decay with distance looks to have been fairly standard for a subduction zone earthquake, but those, they generally produce uh, lower shaking than strike-slip. And so, um, Explaining the, the nature of, of the ground shaking, we basically at this point have three answers or three explanations that contributed to the nature of, of ground motions, and I'm gonna go through those in the time I have left. The first I'm gonna talk about quickly because this isn't work that I've, I've been involved with at all, um, involves the, the overall nature of the earthquake rupture. Uh, so people have used various kinds of data. This is from a NASA JPL team to image how the, how the earthquake moved along the fault. And we know that, in general, large earthquakes, the whole fault isn't moving at once. Uh, it moves, the earthquake happens as a ripple that travels down the length of a fault. So it's it, like if you wanted to pull a very heavy carpet, it would be hard to pull, but if you pull, tugged it and put a ripple into it, that ripple would travel and you could translate the whole rug uh, in the process, and that's, that's how big earthquakes in general happen. Um, and in this case, that ripple traveled smoothly enough. There weren't a lot of jerks and, and starts, uh, fits and starts, uh, to where it just wasn't releasing a lot of high frequency energy. Um, and so again, um, the ground moved relatively coherently and, and smoothly as a result. And then, the effect of ground motions depends on the structures that you have on top of them. So if you're moving the ground back and forth in five seconds, if, it turns out if you had a 50-story building, a 50-story building tends to sway back and forth at about five seconds. And so that's what you don't want, is a correspondence between the, the shaking and, um, and the response of the buildings. 
Um, and that, that's what happened in Mexico City in 1985 where the, the lake bed zone generated <laughs> waves at two seconds and, and that was very damaging to 20-story buildings. So um, fortunately, there are no 50-story buildings in Nepal um, that, to experience this. Uh, what you did have was a lot of buildings that looked like this. You know, they may be a hodgepodge of construction, um, but they're very small. And you, you move something like this, the ground moves back and forth in, in five seconds. This is like a little vulnerable ship riding on a very slow swell, and it just went, was able to go back and forth without a lot of damage. Uh, the few, relatively few tall buildings in the valley are, were as tall as 17 stories. Uh, this was a very new uh, high-end apartment building. They were uh, quite a bit more, more damaged um, than the smaller structures proportionally. Okay, so another part of the story is though the response of, of Kathmandu Valley, because I've already talked about our expectation that ground motions are going to be amplified when you have a sediment-filled valley. Uh, that's something we've known for a long time. We've seen it in this area um, in after 1906, after 1989, uh, the damage in the Marina District, the collapse of the Nimitz Freeway. That was all attributable to the soft sediments, which amplify shaking. And I heard groundwater. Um, so there'd been work done to um, to look at the expected basin response, a lot of this was done by measuring ambient noise or vibrations because there wasn't a lot of uh, data from seismometers. But if you put out a seismometer for a short period of time, measure just the background noise, you can get a lot of information about how the ground is going to respond in, in earthquakes. And so this was a map that shows, I know you can't see the details, but this shows how we expected the, the valley to respond we expected a, a resonance uh, of around, in the Central Valley, around one second, uh, one to two seconds, and then um, varying throughout. So even if the earthquake source had relatively low energy, that still should have fed into the valley and, and should have been amplified, according to our understanding. And I'm going to make this part of the, the story uh, especially short because it gets into some details. But when it, we, we talk about site response and amplification of waves in, in valleys, and we'll often use the analogy of a bowl full of jello. If you have a bowl of jello and you shake it, it's going to wiggle more than a bowl full of rock. And that's how we explain what happened at the, in the marina district, uh, for example. But for very strong shaking, a better analogy would, is not jello, but, but a box of, of sand. Um, and because sand is essentially what sediments are, and they're not really solid uh, entirely. You have you know, grains that are able to shift. If you shook a sandbox really hard, those sand grains are going to move relative to each other, and that process is going to absorb some of the energy by the, the grain shifting instead of transmitting it through and then being able to affect the buildings. And so um, it's something that we've known occurs. We don't have a lot of observations to, um, of exactly the effects of its, uh, what we call nonlinearity. A nonlinear response just means the ground responds differently in a very big earthquake than it does in a smaller earthquake. But I'll, I'll just show this one, one result slide if you look at the predominant energy, this catnip record, I showed you a snippet of it. It actually goes on for like eight minutes and recorded what the ground was doing for the first eight minutes of the sequence. You can see some of the aftershocks that, that happened. Um, but if you look at the energy through <coughs> that, that time, you can actually see the period shift. And that's the difference between shaking it really, really strongly and shaking it less strongly. It just responded differently. Um, it's another results figure. Uh, this is data that's not available yet, but there's a figure that, um, that, that I'm able to show. These are what we call spectral ratios. You look at how the valley moved relative to how the rock moved. 
Um, and what, what you can see here is, in, and uh, you know, this gets into gory details that I'm not going to explain um, in detail, but at high frequencies, so again, this jittery motion that would have been damaging to local buildings, it's actually de-amplified. So that's that process of just zapping out the, the energy. So that, that was an important part of the story. You can actually see the effect if you go back to the intensities. This is Kathmandu Valley. You can see the topography, the central part of the valley. It's yellow right in the central part of the valley where the sediments are the deepest. And then you actually have stronger shaking getting away from the central part of the valley and onto the foothills. So that's again consistent with the signature of, of what we call nonlinearity. So that turns out to have been a very fortunate um, circumstance. And then the last part of the explanation, I think, is the most um, scientifically interesting and maybe the most important, or uh, they're all important, but, but this one is, is the most novel. And that has to do with the, the details of how the earthquake moved. So I've already told you that it was a very smooth and coherent rupture. Um, but it turns out that we, there's more details than that that, that are important. So, okay, when, when seismologists report on earthquake size, whether we say it or not, we're using the moment magnitude scale that uh, has pretty much been adopted uh, fairly universally within the field as the best overall measure of earthquake size. And we may explain that because you know, people ask, is it the Richter scale? We'll say it's the moment magnitude scale. Um, what we don't try to explain is that moment magnitude is not a direct reflection of radiated energy or shaking. Um, some people might say that and, and misspeak because it's, it's a fairly subtle point, but moment magnitude is a static measure of earthquake size. It, it depends on the size of the fault that moved, the patch, and how far it moved. And that correlates pretty well with radiated energy, but they are physically two different things. And an analogy here would be a truck that's loaded up and moving down a road. The a moment magnitude is sort of like the size of the truck and how far it moves down the road. Uh, but if you want to know what's the vibration that's generated in the ground, that's going to depend on how the truck is moving down the road. Was it fast, was it accelerating and decelerating, was the road bumpy, and that's going to determine um, the, the radiated energy. And it turns out that not all earthquakes of the same magnitude <coughs> are created equal. So one of the ways that uh, people have to look at where this higher frequency energy is coming from on the fault is what's called a back projection method. Uh, so it basically uses observations of seismic waves across an array of seismometers. And it could be the Southern California Seismic Network could be an array, for example. If you can watch the waves come across an array, you can project it back and figure out where the energy was coming from. This is Ling Seng Meng, who was a Caltech student, who was one of the early pioneers of, of the method. Uh, he's now at UCLA. Uh, and he did uh, some of the early work to look at where the high frequency energy was preferentially radiated uh, along the fault. So this is a figure that was uh, published by uh, Jean-Philippe Avouac et al. Um, so you can see the overall earthquake. You can see where it slipped in red. And this was so it, most of the, the motion was here. But where the high frequency energy was coming from on this, along the fault wasn't evenly distributed. There was sort of a line that was towards the northern or the, the down dip, the lower edge of the rupture. OK, so let's get back to the intensities. I've shown, I've shown you this map. It sort of looks like a sea of yellow. Um, but there is some variation here. So, so these are intensities. Uh, take the intensities, convert them to peak acceleration, compare that to the predicted values, and you can get a, a peak uh, amplification map across the earthquake. So again, this is what we call the near field rupture, the part of Nepal that was directly on top of 
uh, the earthquake. And so you can see there was some variability and in particular these warmer colors are along the back of the, the northern edge of the rupture. Uh, and these are valued, they're amplifications of a factor of two to three relative to the southern edge. So you put those together and this is a refined estimate of where the high frequency energy was radiated along the fault. And I think you can see here a, a, a pretty good correspondence that where this, this high frequency energy was generated along a, sort of a ribbon of the fault is where the shaking was higher and away from that zone it was lower. This was also good news for Kathmandu Valley which is sitting down here um, because if what matters is the distance to the fault, you're right on top of the fault. That's about 12 kilometers. If what matters is the distance to this high frequency energy, that's 35 kilometers. And that makes a big difference in, because that gives the, the shaking that much more distance to, to attenuate and spread out. And so uh, this is another way to see it if you look at the intensities, and maybe I'll skip some of the details. But it's basically the difference between intensity 8, uh, which can start to be seriously damaging, and intensity 6, which is, is much less damaging. So this is a significant effect, and I think it's a very important lesson uh, from this earthquake and in general. Uh, so this is another cross-section. You can see the plate boundary fault, and in green is the segment that broke uh, overall. So the earthquake happened uh, along this part. The high frequency energy was concentrated down here. It may have been generated here because the fault kinks and so that geometry may have been responsible for generating this energy. But if you look, so here's the overall long period energy and here's the high frequency energy in the very different distributions. Um, and so this has, I, I didn't fix the slide that was messed up in the first talk. Um, when you, let me see what I have. Okay, yeah, I do have it, so let me go to this. Okay, why does this matter? Uh, because when we do hazard assessment, you've, I'm sure you've all seen seismic hazard maps that have scary red zones and, and then green zones that map out the distribution of hazard. So to put together a hazard map, the first thing you do is assess the faults that are in an area, where they are and what size earthquakes are possible and then you calculate for each location how far are you from the faults that could affect that location. So we're here in Menlo Park, you know, for seismic hazard assessment would say we're 20 kilometers from the San Andreas Fault, it could produce a magnitude 8. We're whatever, 60 or 80, 60 kilometers from the Hayward Fault, it could produce a magnitude 7 point something. And you calc and so what matters is the nearest distance because that's the going to be the most dangerous part of that fault. <coughs> so you're doing that calculation, but you're assessing where the faults are and how close they get to every point. And what Nepal is telling us is that that's not necessarily the whole story. It's not where the fault is, but it's going to be where the high frequency energy is generated. And to some extent that may be unpredictable, uh, but for some faults there's some reason to think that we may be able to say something in advance of where that energy is going to come from. So it could be, let me figure out where, okay, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, this is the figure that I meant to show a little bigger, but this is a cross section through uh, my, my hometown, Los Angeles. It has a similar De Colmont fault, if you can see this, that comes up off the San Andreas and goes under the San Gabriel Valley in parts of Los Angeles. So it's a similar fault that could potentially have a similar earthquake. And I think you can, if you can see the cartoon, um, you know, where different places are, they might be closer to the fault, but farther from this down dip edge. Um, so it's going to potentially make a big difference uh, to, to really understand uh, this better. And so, okay, jumping back, uh, sort of taking stock of, of the lessons from the earthquake, it was very much unexpected. Rupture. I mean, we knew earthquakes like this were going to happen, magnitude 8 or even bigger, uh, but with an unexpected damage and ground motion distribution, uh, we're starting to understand why that was. Uh, people are going to be working on this earthquake for years, I'm sure. 
Um, it was in part uh, a relatively smooth rupture. In Kathmandu Valley, you had this what we call nonlinear response. I, I skipped over stuff. Uh, you can also look at the amplification in the Ganges Basin, and there is amplification. There's some other stuff going on. Uh, and then there's this lesson about damage being controlled not by the overall fault or rupture geometry, but the high frequency radiation. I went through that. that. And then we have a, a ton of questions that we're left with. Um, the basin response, exactly how Kathmandu Valley responded. It was a three-dimensional response. The details of nonlinearity, there's a lot to be worked out there. Um, more generally, the flat part of the fault broke, the ramp didn't. And at some point, the ramp has to move because the whole plate, the plates are moving, the whole boundary has to break. And the only answer that makes sense, uh, and this is really a different talk, is that eventually you're going to have to have a bigger earthquake sweep through that same zone. And this is something we saw in Japan with the 2011 earthquake. You can have a plate boundary that has magnitude eights, you know, that are big earthquakes here and there, but they don't really move the whole plate boundary until you get a magnitude nine or nine plus. That's big enough to sweep through and break uh, all the way to the surface. Uh, because it just doesn't make sense that the ramp would, would break by itself in a separate earthquake. Um, one key question is whether the, these ground motions are typical of de Colmont faults. Uh, there's reason to think that uh, they might be, um, which is important to understand. There's a lot of questions about the future earthquakes that could hit Nepal. Uh, the ramp has to break. Uh, there's still the central segment, so the part that ruptured in 1505, most of that's still lurking. It didn't break in this earthquake. The 1934 segment, it's been close to 100 years. That's still lurking on the other side. Uh, there's a potential for large aftershocks, uh, six and a half to seven. At this point, they're very unlikely. Um, but or, you, you could have a large aftershock or just a subsequent event. That could be a worrisome earthquake because if it's closer to Kathmandu Valley or to population centers, it might generate quite a bit of high frequency energy and a, a more moderate earthquake could be uh, even more damaging depending on where it's located. So um, that's basically the, the material I wanted to present, but I just wanted to close with getting back to the question of why scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey are, are going to Nepal to study earthquakes. We're, we're part of the Department of Interior. We have no congressional mandate or funding to work on earthquake hazard in other parts of the world. Um, but there's a number of reasons why. Uh, we respond to earthquakes like this uh, and why it's important. One reason is that it keeps us battle ready uh, for earthquake response. The earthquakes in the U.S. That are, uh, that are damaging are few and far between, fortunately. And just the technical capabilities, the instrumentation, the familiarity, the expertise to respond would get very rusty if we didn't respond to, to earthquakes internationally. But I think the more important uh, part of the answer is that seismology is a young science. Uh, we've only had seismometers for 100 years. We haven't recorded a lot of the most important earthquakes. And the reason it's important to monitor earthquakes everywhere and to chase earthquakes to the ends of the earth when they happen is that big earthquakes anywhere in the world stand to tell us very important lessons about earthquake hazard everywhere in the world. And we need to, to collect the data and analyze it to, to understand those lessons. So that's, that's all I had. I'm happy to take questions if you'd, if you'd like to stay. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. If you have questions for Susan Huff, we've got a couple of microphones, one in this aisle and one on the far aisle. And the reason we like you to use the microphone is not only so that the rest of us in the room can hear you, but for our viewers online. We record these lectures and stream them live. So what we'll do is we'll start over there um, with our first question. We'll go back and forth. Uh, if it's difficult to get to one of those microphones, just wave at me and I'll bring you one. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Huff, it looked like from your charts that the uh, 
depth of the rupture right under the Kathmandu Basin was about 10 kilometers? Yeah, it's about 12. Okay, yeah. and do you have any thoughts about that in relation to there being such a, a large number of areas of Kathmandu that weren't affected badly? Well, I mean, it's just what, what I was talking about. It, it was quite close. Um, so uh, we, sh we expected, you know, if you, just, if you had given somebody a picture of this earthquake and said what shaking is going to be generated in the valley, I think we would have all said intensity eight to nine and much more catastrophic damage. So it was a combination of the factors that I talked about, the way the valley responded, um, and where the, the higher frequency energy was generated. I'm not sure I'm, I, I'm answering your question. Maybe I didn't. Is, um, is 10 or 12 kilometers fairly shallow in your Okay, yeah, or? it is. That is close yeah. in, in these terms. So you would have expected more damage. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, mean I thought that was considered fairly shallow and thus would have probably created more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can imagine, if just thinking in terms of the distance in any direction, if you were 12 kilometers from the San Andreas with a 7.8, yeah. um, you know, that's sort of a scary scenario. So. Yeah. So unexpectedly, uh, more areas than you would have expected weren't, weren't badly uh, damaged. Yeah, yeah that okay. was. No more questions? You guys are a quiet bunch tonight. <laughs> We're usually inundated with lines of questioners. Please step up and use a microphone right behind you. Uh, I am from Turkey, and I was in 1999 earthquake oh. when it happened in August of 1999. Yeah. And um, the earth opened for like as far as we could see. Like it just right. opened. I mean, I didn't fall in, but a lot of people fell in, and that's how. That's why there were 40,000 40, people dead. Um, so what causes like the rupturing of the earth? Okay, I'm not familiar. That was mostly a strike slip fault like the San Andreas. So most of the motion was actually the plates moving sideways. You can get, I mean, earthquakes don't open up huge chasms. If you've seen San Andreas, that's not how earthquakes work. Um, you can get local, um, local opening. You can get um, ground failure if you know, some, some land just sort of settles differentially and sometimes that opens up um, big cracks. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, the observations. In Turkey, there, were, there was quite a bit of, of collapse of buildings that were right along the fault that were, you know, maybe not, uh, not well enough constructed. Uh, that was a strike-slip fault that reached the surface. So that's, you're potentially zero kilometers away from the, the closest fault. So there were some fairly extreme uh, ground motions in that earthquake. But yeah, that's OK, thank you. And uh, one more question. I saw the movie San Andreas. <laughs> Do you think it was realistic? Like? <laughs> it was, it was a f I thought it was a fun movie. Um, you just, it, it had nothing to do with the laws of physics or reality. And OK, no, but, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> An excellent movie review. <laughs> Any other questions this evening? Well, I want to thank. Oh, we have one more question. Are we st studying those old structure? Why th 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 those were st stable and survived? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. You told on the Nepal the new building were damaged, uh, but those old historic structure were not impacted much, which were made from wooden blocks? Um, okay, to, to some extent, there were some of the, the traditional buildings with wood elements that survived fairly well. In part, the oldest parts of the valley, you have mud brick construction. And I didn't show any of these pictures. Some of those were badly damaged um, because they're just so vulnerable. Um, and if, you've, if you're familiar with it, I mean, just mud brick with uh, very old, um, vulnerable. I didn't mention um, 
you know, this, this apparently catastrophic damage. Um, so Brian, is this Barpak? That's Barpak. Barpak. Brian is, is back there. He's the one that was flying around in, in the helicopter um, mapping out the landslides. You know, it looks like catastrophic damage, but a lot of the construction is uh, stone masonry, which is also very vulnerable. And if you look closely at pictures like this, you can actually see the relatively few concrete buildings um, are still standing. So, um, yes, yeah, some. Mm-hmm. So. Go ahead. I have a question about, um, I was in the last Napa Valley uh, mm -hmm. quake in a newly constructed home, on a street of newly constructed homes, and the homes on the west side, which was close to the fault, the homes were untouched, not a crack, nothing, not a scrape, even the patios, not a crack. Mm -hmm. The contents of the homes were destroyed. Every piece of furniture fell, everything was destroyed, cabinets open. Why is it that such a solid envelope that was so protective didn't protect the contents? What allows the high frequency, obviously a higher frequency vibration, to destroy so much within such a stable container? Yeah, well, I mean, it says the house is really well built. Uh, so, which is a good thing. And houses in California that are built to modern code are, are very well constructed to, to withstand a, a magnitude six earthquake. But you're still shaking the ground, right? So you're not, the house is sitting on the ground, it's, it's, well, it's well coupled. So if you shake the house back and forth fast enough, you're just shaking everything inside it. And so, and there again, it was a, it was a vertical fault that came up or very close to the surface, very close, I guess. So you did have high frequency shaking that's going to affect the, the contents. Use the, if you've got questions, please use the microphone. Right, a, a quick question about the seismographs. I was kind of struck how few had data that has been shared so far, and if you can speak about that, and mm. also to where is the catnip one, and is there a local partner? Okay, what was the second question? Um, for the catnip seismograph, uh, is there a local partner that was helpful on that, or was that just a USGS thing in a um, US uh, building? Okay, this was sort of a, a seat of the pants thing that, um, these are, this is a, a type of instrument known as a net quakes that the USGS here has developed and, and uses. There's quite a few of them out in the Bay Area. There are these little blue boxes that are designed to sit in people's homes. And when uh, John Galetsko was working in, uh, he had a project in Nepal installing GPS, and people were just talking to each other, and, oh, maybe you could take a net quakes. And so there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, formal, there wasn't a, a big project. It was more kind of, oh, you know, this would be cool. Um, and so, you know, John took the instrument, he installed it on property that's essentially the U.S. Embassy. Um, and so it, it kind of is a de facto USGS instrument. There, there was no uh, local partner agency. Um, and so that's why, you know, data collected by the USGS, as soon as we have it, you have it. It's, it's pushed out to the, to the world community. In Southeast Asia, um, it, it's not the same tradition of, of data sharing. And who asked the question? I'm, I lost you, and so I don't know where to look. <laughs> okay, there you are. Um, yeah, they don't have the same tradition of data sharing in, across Asia and South Asia. And this earthquake was frustrating because it happened smack in the middle of a region where people don't share data. Uh, China is a big offender, um, India. Nepal is, I sympathize with Nepal a little more. They're so resource strapped that they struggle to collect data and process it. And, um, but people basically view data as currency. You know, I, I collected this bit of data and, you know, they, they don't want to give it out. It's, it's you know, they, they want to um, have it to analyze for some period of time. Um, maybe work in collaboration, but not have people grab the data and run off and do science. Um, 
there's, boy, I could talk <laughs> for a while. Um, I, it's a problem in, in that part of the world. Um, and I, I would say India and China. Um, this is being broadcast to the world, so. Um, uh, India and China are, are um, will hopefully take steps um, to share data more in the future, but it's just been a problem. There was a big earthquake in China a few years back, the Wenchuan earthquake of magnitude 7.8, a hugely important data set, and I don't think that data have ever been released. So I'm sort of dancing around your question for a reason, um, in part because the, this is being broadcast, but it, it's very political and it's longstanding. Uh, my question is back to San Francisco. Um, they are building these like high rises, 40 stories, 50 stories on field land in San Francisco and by the Embarcadero and in Mission Bay. If an earthquake like this happened in the Bay Area, would they okay. like would they be strong enough to stand? Yeah, that's, I'm not the best person to answer that question. Um, I mean, it's something people are very aware of. At one point, there was actually a moratorium on tall buildings uh, until because of some concerns that were raised um, and until you know, the engineers came up with, with designs that, um, that were appropriate. Uh, there's some very, um, some of the best earthquake engineers in the world are you know, work in this area, have worked on designs of, of these tall buildings, and they, um, they think that they are engineered well enough to withstand even very large earthquakes. Um, but it would, it would be a, um, a, different, a different person should really answer that besides me. Thank you. I want to... Um call us a night because it's getting late. I want to thank Susan Huff for a wonderful talk. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Say have a, a good rest of the year and please join us again in January for our continuing lecture series. Thank you. Thank you.